Hello and welcome to Classic Golf Clubs. This time we've got another attempt at me trying to show that blades aren't impossible to hit for the average golfer. And a quick review of the clubs, which I apologise in advance for droning on for far too long. If you don't want to watch all of that and just watch the play, then skip ahead to about the ten and a half minute mark when play will start. What am I going to be playing today then? We'll work our way down through the bag uh, as usual, starting with the driver or the one wood, which is quite a battered looking example as you can see. Um, I bought this one um, from eBay, um, it was a rather poor quality picture and when I received it, it didn't quite live up to my expectations. Well I think it cost me less than £10 including carriage so I can't really grumble. Um, it obviously needed quite a bit of restoration doing on it. We can see that one of the screws holding the insert in position uh, just there has broken um, or sheared and we've got the stub of the screw still in there. The insert itself seems pretty well glued in. I think the club has been restored at some point in its life. Uh, the glue uh, around there is a sort of a white finish which wouldn't have been the original. Um, and also, I don't know whether you can see that clearly on the camera or not, but in the heel here, we've got quite a bit of epoxy that's been used to rebuild um, the persimmon. Obviously, it's been struck quite a lot in the heel, and that's sort of uh, caused that to wear away. And epoxy has been used to build that up again, and the new lines have been cut. Not very uh, accurately spaced, as you can see, so that will need addressing at some point as well. Uh, quite a bit of work really and not something I felt confident about doing anything with when I got this one so it just sat in the in the, in the garage for a while until eventually uh, I thought well I'll take it out to play and see if it's worth restoring and the few rounds I've had with it I've got to say it's it's one of my best drivers it, it really hits the ball nicely just sits nicely for my uh, my play um, so yeah it will be restored um, at some point in the future but at the moment I'm playing it as is uh, all the glue seems well um, in position the uh, insert and sole plate are firm so let's have a quick talk about the driver now I've chatted for long enough about uh, how I came by it it's a John Letters driver um, when it was restored any transfer or decals that are on there have been uh, removed so there's no telling what model it is uh, from the sole plate, this uh, sort of straight line sole plate, it's obviously a fairly early one. So I would say it's probably late 1950s in date. Um, what it came with, I don't know. It might have been one of the early Masters models. Um, but a very nice uh, club. Can't really see the grain there. Um, but it, it just feels a very solid block. Nice whipping, a nice ferrule on there as well. Uh, the shaft on this one is a True Temper rocket shaft, what's left of the band there. And this dates it somewhere around the um, late 1950s. The grip's been replaced at some time, it's just a Lankin uh, standard grip. Um, so yeah, there we go. Uh, very rough looking club, but a very good play club. Second club is another John Letters. Uh, this one, I had. I think this was the first club I tried to restore. Um, I wasn't looking to do anything wonderful with it, just get it into uh, condition to play. The insert was a bit loose and the sole plate was a bit bent as well. So all I've done is remove the insert, re-glued it into position, cleaned everything up. I didn't sand the head down or anything. I didn't want to lose the, uh, the decal there. We can see it's a John Letters Shopmaster model. Um, I think this is a 1960s club. Uh, we can see on the sole plate there, I'll spin this round, hopefully try and get it into shot. There we are, John Letters, made in Scotland, uh, and it's a two and a half wood, which is quite unusual. Uh, and it's got, upside down again, it just seem to be twirling this round like a drum majorette. Oilomatic, uh, which was a obviously an oil hardened persimmon so again they're, they're both persimmon woods and the two and a half wood uh, is a very nice club as well so very happy to have those in the bag now let's move on to the irons 
And here are the irons, the Schlesinger, Bobby Lock, Claret Jug, and we've got four stars on there, which I would imagine um, signifies this was after his fourth uh, Open win, which I think was 1957. And I think that would date these clubs to around about 19, well, the late 1950s, early 1960s. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, one of those. On the table here, I've got three, five, seven, wedge and sand iron. I do have the full set three to sand iron on these. If we just go through these, so starting with the three iron, just have a look at that. We can see Bobby Lock's signature there. Nice uh, picture of the claret jug. The four stars and the Schlesinger name. We turn it over. Um, nice hosel, a bit of knurling on there. And we've got on the hosel there, YTD2. Uh, what that signifies, I'm not 100% sure. D2 could be the swing weight. And it's an attractive feral black. And then we've got three red stripes as well. If we look at the 7 iron, it gives us an idea of how these multicoloured ferrules were sometimes built up because this one's starting to separate a bit. Um, so the, the different coloured um, bands were actually separate rings and then they're all forced together and stuck together. And then if we look at the sole of one of these, I'll stick with the 7 iron. You see quite an unusual um, element. It's got 7 and then plus... Um, I was told by a guy that used to do quite a bit of work with Slazengers that the plus signifies that these are a strong lofted set um, intended for uh, the better player who likes a, a longer distance from the clubs. But I think it's again it's a bit of a, a marketing ploy really because the the length of the clubs. Um, if I just go back to the lofts first, I said these were strong lofted. They're about one club stronger than normal. So this 7 iron, I would normally expect to be uh, about 40 degrees. It's actually 44 degrees. Um, so it's one club stronger, but it's also one club longer. So it is in effect just a 6 iron with a 7 uh, plus stamped on the bottom. Um, so... I'm not sure why they did that, but it's, it's been going on ever since. Clubs have been getting stronger and stronger in the loft. The wedge on this one follows this, exactly the same design as the other ones. W plus, and this is 48 degrees rather than 52, which probably would have been the case around about 1960 when these were produced. The sand iron, it's got plus on the bottom, but this is just a standard 56 degree sand iron. So the downside of that is that we've ended up with a gap um, in the set. Uh, the three iron, I think it's 20 degrees or somewhere close to that, down to the wedge at 48, and then we go to 56. So we've got an eight degree gap there. And um, well, Slazinger obviously missed a marketing chance because they've not uh, come up with a, a, a gap wedge uh, to sell a, another club. But the, coming on to the sand wedge itself, I really like this club, um, really thick sole on it, nice weight to it and uh, it, it's it's working very nicely out the bunkers. Um, so yep, yeah, that's the, the heads of the clubs. We'll just look at the uh, the shaft and the shaft label, normal step shaft, uh, True Temper Pro Fit. I think this came out about 1959 and ran through the 60s. And we've also got on there a Slazinger uh, Bobby Lock. Uh, band as well put that one back there and I'll just pause it there while I because I, I mentioned the gap in the clubs I have uh, selected a club to go into that gap well, here's the club that I chose to fill the gap between the wedge and the sand wedge it's a, a Dunlop uh, Peter Thompson um, well, they call this one a retriever which was I don't know whether it's Peter Thompson's name or a Dunlop name but it, Rather than wedge, it's called a retriever. We've got the Dunlop uh, D there. And this club was produced from 1957. Very nice club. Uh, I'm going to do a review on the, the full set of these at some stage. Um, so I won't go into too much detail about this one. So that one uh, fills in the gap between the wedge and the sand iron. And we conclude with the putter. And this is another Slazinger club. It's the Slazinger Pinehurst model, which I think came out from about nine. Well, the, the irons and the wood certainly came out around 1954. No reason to doubt that the putter wasn't included at the same time. 
So I think this dates from around about 1954. Nice putter, um, blade style as you can see. Uh, little top line groove there. Nice ferrule, um, black with a thin red uh, white line and two red lines. And the, the shaft band on this one, I think is a true temper dynamic, which is a uh, very little left of it. The grip's quite an interesting one. It's an early cord style grip. You do find these on old putters sometimes. So there we are, the putter. Just a straightforward um, blade style putter. I apologise again for rambling on for so long about the clubs. Time to get out on the course now. Before we do so, here are the lofts of the clubs in the bag for today. There we are then, the Slazinger Bobby Lock irons, very handsome set, 3 to 9 plus wedge, and as I said the wedge is quite strong lofted at 48 degrees, so I've got this Dunlop Peter Thompson retriever in there at 51 to balance things out. The Slazinger Pinehurst putter, which won't come into focus, so I won't bother looking at that. The John Letters two and a half wood and the John Letters driver. Very uh, raw looking piece of kit that one, but it seems to hit the ball quite well. I've cursed it now saying that. Anyway, let's uh, kick things off on this hole with the, I think I'll use the John Letters two and a half wood. A bit of water to be avoided on this hole, as you can see on the overhead, just in front of the tee and on the left at driving distance. I hit a nice drive, just a little bit to the left, where it finds the left rough. Well I found it, I've got about 165 to go, no chance of getting there out of the rough, I'm just going to get out with a 9-iron, hopefully. Mission accomplished. From the discs, I think I've got about 45, 46 to the front, so probably just over 50 yards to the the flag, hitting a, a sand iron. Awkward tailed swing, but it, it got to the green. And it left me about a 15 or 18 foot put. Just slid by on the right, but a simple tap in for the bogey. On to the next hole where I'm using the John Letters one wood. Nice drive straight down the middle. That left me about 140 yards and I hit the seven iron. Yard short, dropped in the bunker. <laughs> Trying to down the line for a change. I think I've only done one of these ones before. That's another tap in for the bogey.
opting for the John Letters two and a half wood again. And I struck this one really well, just run into the right hand rough, but about 210, 220 yards. That's left me with a wedge to the green. It isn't quite the best contact, but it just makes the front edge. Green in regulation and a longish birdie put. Slides by on the right. Another tapping, but this time for a par. My last hole was a par three over water and I left the green feeling very pleased with myself having made a, a textbook par, green in regulation and two puts only then to find that I'd made a classic um, YouTube error of getting out of sync with my on and off buttons uh, here you can see me setting up a uh, quick final check on the camera alignment I think I'm turning the camera on but actually I'm turning the camera off so you don't see the lovely shot to the back part of the green I go to turn the camera off turning it back on and now you've got the pleasure of watching me uh, wheel my trolley which the camera's attached to um, up to the green I've speeded this up a bit so hopefully it won't be quite as boring as it could be at last we've arrived at the green I've taken the camera off the trolley and just a few pitch mark repairs and then I start to try and find a nice place to position the camera uh, to, to show my uh, putting prowess that looks good I now think I'm turning the camera on but of course I'm actually turning it off so the ensuing two put isn't recorded I go and turn the camera off turning it back on and I exit the green and just as I reach my bag I come to the horrific conclusion of what I've done what a dunder head to summarize then and I need you to trust me on the hole that wasn't recorded I had two pars and two bogeys so two over par for the uh, four holes um, some of my best statistics in fact I uh, just need to practice my camera operation. That's it for this one. There is a follow-up video coming up very soon where I play a match against another classic club uh, enthusiast using these clubs. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to watch that one in the near future. Well, thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time.